Okay, call to the councils returning from closed session. City Attorney, do you have anything to report? Uh, yes, good evening, Mayor. Uh, the City Council is in closed session this evening on two items, conference with labor negotiator and public employee appointment, clerk administrator. There's no action to report on either item. Thank you, sir. We will close the closed session and roll call for the open session. Council members Payne, present. Hewitt? Here. Campion? Here. Powers? Cruz? Here. If you could all stand for a minute of silent prayer. And our flag salute will be by PAC 84. Liz, could we get the video statement? This meeting of the Galt City Council is being videotaped in its entirety and will be cable cast without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the Government Affairs Channel on the Comcast and SureWest cable system. Okay, any agenda approval, additions, or deletions? Uh, yes, I would like to pull uh, E4 and 5 for discussion. And if council's all right with it, I'd like to move I-1 forward to just after scheduled matters. And considering we're missing Mary Lou Powers, can we also move our outside agency appointments I-2 to the January 6th meeting? We won't have a problem with that. No. Okay. Awesome. Presentation, Department of Transportation Substance Abuse Policy and random, random Drug Testing Policy, Human Resources. Paula. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Yes, this is the Human Resources presentation that um, all of the departments do on, a, on an occasional basis. And my topic tonight is Department of, Substance, Department of Transportation Substance Abuse and Drug Testing Policy. <coughs> so the next slide, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. I'm sorry, we don't have a remote clicker tonight. The reason that the City of Galt has this program is because that, uh, the Omnibus Transportation Employee Testing Act of 1991, which requires drug and alcohol testing for all safety-sensitive transportation employees. What it does is basically prohibits the use of drugs, alcohol, or any other substance which alters the employee's you know, ability to perform their job. And, of course, we don't allow that for any employees, but um, this just happens to cover only those individuals um, that drive um, vehicles under the DOT program. So the goals of the program are really just to ensure the safety of the employee along with the other employees that are working with that individual. Also, to prevent risks to our community and also to encourage employees to seek help if they do have drug or alcohol abuse problems. So it's not only, you know, that we're saying, you know, you can't come to work like that and so on and so forth, but also if there's an issue, it's also supporting the employee that we want them to get help. So for the City of Galt, the positions covered under this program, um, it's not only jobs 
descriptions, it's actually what the employee is doing. And it's for any individual that operates um, a vehicle that requires a commercial driver's license. This is a class A, B, or a C with hazardous materials endorsement. So the positions really that we have in the DOT program right now are our equipment and plant mechanics, parks and public works maintenance, worker, maintenance workers and their supervisors, and then also our public works supply technician. So as I mentioned, our employees should not be coming to work under the influence of any type of drug or alcohol, but the DOT program is very strict and their requirements as an employee under this program is that they cannot report to work with a blood alcohol level of 0.04 or greater. <coughs> of course, no on-use duty, or non-duty use, excuse me. They cannot perform work within four hours of consuming alcohol. They can't refuse to take a required DOT drug test and they cannot use um, any controlled substance and they cannot take legal medication that they know that would interfere with them safely performing their jobs. So it is a little more stringent than our other employees. With the DOT program, there are several times when the employees, if you want to, thank you, um, will be tested and they are all tested pre-employment. So we, we run the DOT pre-employment drug test before they start. Um, if once they're at work, if there's any time that we feel that they're under the influence of drug or, drugs or alcohol, and it can even be um, legal, you know, medi medicine, but anything that they appear intoxicated, then we can do reasonable suspicion testing, and we train our supervisors to recognize that, and we can take them directly to our occupational health doctor and have them um, tested on the spot. And there's random testing, and again, that's a little different from our regular substance abuse program, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, return to duty. If an employee tests positive at any time and they're off work, um, because of this reason, we would test them again. You know, they'd have to be clean before they can return to work. And if they're in an accident while on work, or at work, excuse me, if, there's, um, if the accident is there's a fatality or someone is taken to the hospital from the accident or any cars are towed from that accident, then that automatically triggers, triggers a DOT drug test. The random drug testing is probably the most unique part and um, our DOT employees, are, are they're placed in a pool and so every quarter um, we draw names and either the employees that have, have been drawn are tested for alcohol or drug use. And um, we have an outside vendor called GASCO, and they conduct the random selection for us. So every quarter, I will get a couple names of who to um, send for drug testing, and I will call the supervisor and let them know that they have to come right now, go to the occupational health doctor, and be tested. And again, sometimes it's for alcohol, and sometimes it's for drug use. Um, the outside vendor really helps us because they keep us in compliance with the DOT program. We have to test at least 50% of our dri drivers each year and 10% of them, or 10% of it has to be for alcohol. So just to main, maintain objectivity and just know that we're doing it correctly and um, by an independent resource, um, they're the ones that do our random drug testing. So pool, you know, they draw for the... Um, for the, the drivers that will be tested. So once they go to the doctor, um, occupational health doctor, everything is sent to a lab and then I get confidential results as to whether or not they passed or failed the drug test. So I just wanted to mention too, because I kind of referred to it a little bit, we do have a non-DOT policy. And so we do drug testing for our employees that are in positions that are either safety, police officers and, and that sort, or else um, that have to do with children. Any of our employees that are working at the pool, ha rec recreation workers, they are all um, drug tested prior to employment. And um, we used to drug test all of our employees at pre-employment, but because of certain laws passed recently, well actually the last three or four years, we're only able to do those that are in safety and positions that are related you know, to working with children. But any employee, if we feel that they've come to work under the influence, we can always do the reasonable suspicion drug testing. So I just wanted to let you know that our supervisors have been trained in reasonable suspicion um, in our policy. Um, 
The last thing I wanted to mention is that we've had these policies since 2006 when we started the drug testing, and we've never had any employee proof positive for um, drugs or alcohol, either the, in the pre-employment or the random drug testing. So I think we have a pretty good uh, track record. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Public comment? Can I read public comment? Yes, please. <coughs> Under Government Code, Section 54954.3, members of the public may address the Council on non agenda items. Speakers may address Council. Speakers may address Council on any agenda item during consideration of the item. Speakers shall restrict their comments to issues that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City of Council and limit comments to a maximum of three minutes. Please fill out a speaker sheet located at the tables outside the entrance, or actually inside the entrances, to the Council Chambers and forward the completed speaker sheet to the Clerk. And I have one speaker sheet, Al Baldwin. Good evening, Al Baldwin, one of the concerned citizens of a wonderful city called Gulf. The city of character and growing in leaps and bounds. What I want to do tonight is to thank you, council and staff, uh, for giving me the opportunity to do the things that I do in this town. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. I hope to continue it, but I, I don't believe I've ever thanked you. So tonight, I want to thank you. It's been wonderful, and I've still got a few things more to go, but I may not be here next week to say anything, and you won't be, so it won't be till next year. So I figured I would do it ahead of time. And uh, wishing you a, I, I don't like to use the word happy holidays, but you know I do wish you that. But I have to say Merry Christmas. Thank you all. Do you want to thank you all. Merry Christmas. Okay, consent calendar under items four and five. They were pulled by Vice Mayor Payne. Uh, and yes, and the question I have really kind of covers both of them. The uh, bidding process that I'm most familiar with is we have our specs and we put it out there for uh, interested parties to bid. And both of these items are somewhat different. And so I'd kind of like for you to explain uh, why we're able to do it this way and maybe any advantage. Sure. Um, council members, uh, item uh, E4 on your agenda is recommending approval to purchase a Case 580 backhoe from a local equipment machinery company. And um, as Council Member Payne points out, uh, this item and the subsequent item E5 uh, related to the purchase of a street sweeper are using uh, procurement tools that are within the city's uh, procurement policy toolkit. Uh, they're informal bids for amounts that are less than fixed assets, and then once we get over 30000 we need to bring approval to award a contract to your council. But there are also two other tools. One is piggyback purchasing, where if another agency has gone out and competitively bid a like piece of equipment, um, we can dispense with formal competitive bidding on our part um, and use their competitively bid price on the same piece of equipment, provided that bid was procured within the last 24 months. So it has to be a fairly recent uh, equipment bid. Um, the other type, which is what this first item would utilize, is cooperative purchasing, where we, the city, participates in several cooperative purchasing groups. Uh, they're typically public agency or quasi-public agency groups, school districts, park districts, and things get together. And in this case, um, it's part of the National Joint Powers Alliance, where we're a member of that, and they go out and bid on behalf of all of their member agencies, um, sort of using the the, the clout of bulk purchasing or the, or the opportunity to, to sell equipment to many agencies. Um, this happens to be a national agency uh, and typically used by many public agencies, including the federal government, uh, where they've gotten developed procurement lists. And they'll expect a variety of many different types of equipment, different manufacturers, different options. 
and then get companies to competitively bid on a, in this case, nationwide product pricing that they make available throughout the United States to public agencies. And um, uh, so, what those both of those piggyback and cooperative purchasing do for the city of the Gulf, we do not have our own purchasing department. Each department has to. Uh, in accordance with the procurement manual uh, and policy, you have to develop their own purchase orders, do their own specification writing, do their own bidding. It takes a lot of time to specify and write equipment specs that are non-proprietary. Um, but by virtue of using the purchasing groups or piggyback, we're basically uh, plagiarizing the work that's been done by others, uh, saving the staff time, and we don't necessarily have the expertise in every type of equipment being, being a small staff. And so we take advantage of experts in the field who have put together product specifications, competitively bid them, and then made that pricing available to member, member agencies. So in the case of E4, the BACCO, we're recommending that you um, approve a resolution authorizing the purchase of a Case 580 BACCO from Sons Ray Equipment in the amount of 94,878.50 and with a council approval to use the cooperative purchasing procedures where we would basically use the National Joint Powers Alliance bid pricing. Uh, the vendor is, is on that list and is willing to honor that price and um, that would uh, be funded jointly about 30% from our wastewater treatment funds and 70% uh, from our water distribution is used primarily uh, to, um, to do street repairs to water services or dig up sewer repairs when we have block lines and that would be the shared funding. Uh, and further, we're going to leverage that uh, when we get the new piece of equipment. Uh, we've got an existing uh, piece of equipment that's nearing the end of the service life but still has utility left, but it's uh, probably getting tired for day in, day out usage and uh, we would actually uh, give that to the wastewater plant which has need for a, for a more capable backhoe out there and then their used backhoe would be given to parks and recreation uh, for use with field maintenance and other needs when they have to dig up irrigation lines, et cetera. So we're going to kind of try to leverage three ways uh, the opportunity to purchase a new backhoe with your approval. Item E5 is uh, similarly we would be using uh, the piggyback purchase. In this case, um, we're looking at a um, Timco Model 600 diesel street sweeper. Our existing uh, frontline street sweeper is again uh, very much at the end of its service life. Uh, it's been in the shop a uh, fair number of times in the last year and a half and uh, we're expending quite a bit of money to keep it active and particularly during leaf season it took a beating this year and uh, we need to get that replaced before summer gets here. And uh, we're proposing that that um, utilize piggyback purchasing uh, with the city of Coalinga. Mm -hmm. They just last month in well, November uh, did a purchase of an exact same model uh, with the exception of two minor uh, accessories and the, uh, uh, the local dealer is willing to honor that price and uh, make that available to the city for the amount purchase price of $232,283.31. Um, we are also asking for this particular item. Uh, the way it was budgeted was uh, given that it's coming out of uh, primarily out of the street and the uh, landscape and lighting district and storm drain funds that, uh, well, the particular stormwater funds and street funds, uh, I stand corrected equally. Both of those funds have limited reserves and so that would be a $230,000 hit would be hard. So we budgeted to pay that over five years using lease purchase financing. So we'd ask that you'd authorize the city manager also to execute a lease purchase agreement and we have a pro forma sheet uh, attached to your staff report on what the terms and conditions would be. We'd use this year's budget as a down payment, 55000 and then the remaining would be spread over the next four years and would be budgeted accordingly. You gave me a lot of information. Basically, I, I don't disagree that we need this equipment. I was just questioning the process of bidding, uh, especially the one for the city of Kalinga. Uh, do they have the same process that we have? And are other um, manufacturers also given an opportunity to compete or not? Uh, in this case, the process we used for both pieces of equipment was to look at our current fleet and what our, um, you know, we happen to own multiple pieces of case equipment in the case of the backhoe. Uh, it has served us very well. We've got about 16 years out of the most recent backhoe that we're replacing and we already have 
uh, factory training for our mechanics on case equipment and would uh, recommend that we go with that. Uh, so in this case, the specification that we found um, a piggyback uh, spec for, I'm sorry, a cooperative purchasing was for the case backhoe. Uh, case dealers all over the United States can put in bids for these cooperative purchasing arrangements. Other equipment makers also have items on the list. Uh, in this case, uh, we felt that the case would be best serving city's interests. So in this case, just case equipment would be looked at. Um, case of uh, um, the street sweeper, uh, Koalinga, we went through a process. We actually tried out four different makes of street sweepers, and they were kind enough to demo those and, to us, where we had them, and some of them for several weeks. And Rocky, our, Alice, our uh, street sweeper, uh, got to go out and try those with the factory rep on board for a couple of days, and they let us keep them. Uh, they were all interested in selling. All the equipment performed well. We felt best suited for us. Uh, we're actually replacing the Timco, and this would be the newest generation of Timco. We feel it's still well suited to the city's needs. So we um, worked with the um, local equipment vendor to see if they had a competitive price out there that would be suitable for a piggyback purchase, and uh, the Colinga price is actually. Uh, better than the National Joint Powers Alliance pricing nationwide. So you feel like in both cases we got the best buy for our... Uh, it is buck. possible that if we competitively bid them that we might save a little more, but in that these are very recent bids here in California with our air quality requirements, um, we don't think that we would likely save more than uh, we probably spend more in the process of procurement and developing specs and going out to bid and staff time than we would save in an open market procurement. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and move the items. Do I need to do each one individually? Okay, so I will. Um, I would move the first item for approval. Second. Call for Second. Council members Payne? Aye. Hewer? Aye. Campion? Aye. Cruz? Aye. Okay, pass unanimous. Item number five. Then I would uh, also move for approval the recommendation for the next item. Item number five. Excuse me. Do I have a second? A second. Call for vote, please. Council members Payne? Aye. Hewer? Aye. Campion? Aye. Cruz? Aye. Unanimous. Okay, and the remaining consent calendar. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. second. Okay. Call for vote, please. Second. She's second. Okay, sorry. Council members. Payne? Aye. Hewer? Aye. Campion? Aye. Cruz? Aye. Okay. Moving up under scheduled matters. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate for us to move H, actually I-1 forwards, since we have people in the audience that are looking for these, these items as far as the commissions and committees. How do we want to go about this, go about doing this, starting off well, with planning? Um, I think we're going to, I actually with planning we have <coughs> just some announcements. So I think we're going to take it down the list. Okay. But I wanted to announce the Planning Commission uh, has already, they've, we've already had appointments to the Planning Commission. Council, uh, Mayor Cruz appointed Leanne McFadden. Councilmember Powers appointed Craig Morris. Councilmember Hewer appointed Sherry Daly. We have one vacancy, which is Councilmember Campion's, and we will be bringing that back at a later date. Okay. Okay, then move on to Parks and Rec. Parks and Recreation. We do have three vacancies, <coughs> excuse me, on Parks and Recreation Commission. We have two letters of interest, uh, one in front of you, one is in your packet, Bill Parkin and Joseph Batondo. So I would entertain uh, appointments to that committee from the two, the three newly elected council members. Council member here. Um, I think I'd like to hold off on making an appointment at this time. Okay. And we do not have council member powers here. As for myself, I would have talked to the gentleman. I think you would do an excellent job. Uh, Mr. Bill Parkins. Bill Parkins. Okay. Our next is the beautification committee. We have three vacancies, plus we also have the alternate uh, as, as vacant. At this time, we have two letters of interest. Uh, the two letters are from uh, Fatima Ortega and Fatima Lopes, who have been serving on the Beautification Committee. And at this time, I would ask Council Members Cruz or Hewer and Hewer to make appointments. I'd like to appoint Fatima Lopes. Okay. 
Yeah, Fatima Ortega, okay. please. Okay. Commissioner on Aging. We again have three vacancies plus an alternate. There are three letters of interest in front of you. Sherry Darchek, Alvin Roberts, who have served on the committee, and Marie Hall, I don't believe has served. Uh, she's a newly uh, interested person. So I would ask the two council members if you would like to make an appointment. Appoint Marie Hall. Oh, okay. Alvin Roberts, please. Okay, great. Public Safety Committee. We have three vacancies as well as the alternate position. Two letters of interest, Dave Dahlgren and Lyle Laggy. I think so. I would ask entertain appointments at this time. What were the names again? Um, Dave Dahlgren and Lyle Laggy. Dave Dahlgren has served on the Measure R Committee, and I believe he's here. And Lyle Laggy uh, was on the is on the Public Safety Committee and his term is up. I appoint Dave Alburn. And Lyle. Okay. And the Galt Youth Committee. There are three vacancies. I have letters from Lupe Flores, who has been serving on the committee, Lisa Klotz, who has been serving on the committee. We have a new uh, interested, uh, Tony Ricina. I said that. Right. I appoint Tony Ricina. Lisa Klotz, please. Okay. And there are no Measure R appointments. That'll come before you in about uh, a couple months. I believe the term ends in April. And that's it for the internal committee and commission. Call this clinical. Yeah. That's, a, that's on the kind of the other end, the one you pulled, because it's a, an appointment by the entire council. Okay. For the mosquito abatement? Oh, mosquito abatement. We can do that one. Yes, we can. Um, I have one letter of interest from Fred Gatel. He has, has been serving on that uh, for a number of years. I nominate Fred. Okay. Second. I don't think we need a vote on that, do we? Just a consensus. See? Does everybody agree? Is there a consensus okay consensus with that? On that, correct? Yes. Agree. Okay. okay. And then Very good. And we'll hold off on the rest of these till next meeting. Yes. Yeah. Right. When, we when we have a full correct council. Okay. Um, with the council's indulgence, I'd like to deviate just a small bit. As many may know, uh, many in the audience may not know, this is actually our last meeting with our city clerk, Liz, Liz Aguirre, sorry, Liz Hagland. I've known you Liz Aguirre for I so long. long. Um, I'd like to pause to acknowledge this and just, I don't know what it's going to be like up here without you. It's going to be very hard. Um, and I would invite council to say, say whatever they're feeling at the same time. Liz, you've been a, a, a wealth of information when we've had problems. We've had any type of issues as far as procedures or questions about what happened even as far back as 1984 that I can remember. You've been able to pop up with the answers for me. I'm, I'm really going to miss you in the position. <laughs> yes, but you had the information. I welcome anyone else to to speak up. Otherwise, uh, I'd like to take a 15 minute break. There's actually a cake in the community room as well as refreshments to celebrate this. Well, I, I'd like to say a couple things too. I worked very closely with uh, Liz for 25 years and uh, known her for over 30. Um, Liz has done a, uh, an excellent job as city clerk. Um, she's been a friend, and uh, I know that uh, uh, she did uh, the best job she could, and, and not only for the city of Galt, but uh, is a, as a representative in the statewide association of clerks, uh, very well recognized, and uh, for her efforts there and uh, for her expertise. And, uh, I think the city of Galt is very fortunate to have you. Absolutely, I appreciate it. 
Well, and I would like to say, uh, as I, when I was a newcomer to the city council, uh, she helped me in so many ways, I can't even name them. Uh, mostly she kept me out of trouble, I think, from doing the wrong thing. But she's always been very supportive, always been there. Uh, we could even call her at home uh, if we needed help. So on vacation. Just, yeah, on vacation too. So she's yeah. just been uh, uh, so helpful and I, I just can't find enough words to say how much I appreciate all the help you've been to me personally, as well as the city. I'd just like to congratulate you on your retirement. I remember all those years ago when you came to my door asking for a vote. <laughs> and when you, and uh, I've considered you a friend ever since. And uh, we will greatly miss you, but I know you'll still be here and you'll still be available. And, uh, have a wonderful retirement. You have greatly earned it. <laughs> Okay, as I said, Mr. Um, Mayor, can I just say something really quick on behalf of you? No. <laughs> I know, uh, I know. There's a big party for Liz on Friday in which she will be roasted mercilessly. So I'll be kind on her this evening. But uh, I just, I want to echo everything the council said, which is we all, from behalf of all of staff, really, uh, really enjoyed working with you, and you will be missed very deeply. And uh, you have very big shoes to fill, and wish you nothing but the best in your retirement. Don't be a stranger. See, I got called on that comment. I said, don't say that. You don't say that to a woman. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll take 15 minutes. There's cake and refreshment in the other room. We'll be back here at 7.48.
the, the, the uh, one for sure. One for sure, but not the other. Oh, I didn't yeah. understand that. She was for sure. I mean, I'm sure you talked. Well, that's what we're assuming that she has to officially meet the other one. I mean, that's what the first part of the summer. What's that? The first part of the summer. Oh. Like my, I have to talk. Well, right. you got the, uh, the last report, the last no, books no. report. Huh? We're good to go? Yeah. Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. Sure. Next up, City Council Office. City Council Procedural Guidelines, Proposed Amendments. Council Member Hewer, you're up. I asked for this item to be brought back. Um, a couple of things in the in the procedural guidelines that I was interested in looking at started out with the the section 1.3, the election of the mayor and vice mayor, to change that to a one year term that we reorganize every year. Um, part of my reasoning for that has to do with the fact that, and I've looked into it, um, all of the surrounding cities that have mayors that serve at the pleasure of the council. Um, reorganize every year of Lodi, Folsom, Rancho Cordova, Citrus Heights. All of those um, bodies, our local school boards, reorganize every year. And I, even though we might choose to keep our mayor for two years, three years, or whatever we, the council chose, I still think we need to look every year at reorganizing to um, just for that opportunity to look at changing. So that item, I also looked at item um, 1.59, all persons are eligible to serve at um, committees at the discretion of the city council, regardless of citizenship, residency, or voter registration. I would really ask that we consider that um, we look at that being residents of the city of Galt. And um, our, even our boards, if you look at 1.64, all of our boards and commissions reorganize annually. It's only the city council that doesn't reorganize annually. So that's um, the other issue was that um, one of the members of the public had brought up the five minute rule, the three minute rule, and was asking that we look at um, going back to that item, going back to looking at um, members of the public being able to speak longer than the three minute rule. I also agree with that public member that five, sometimes three minutes just isn't enough time for the public to be able to express themselves and we're often having to cut them off. Well, five minutes might give them a much better opportunity and if it's an item in which there's a lot of public comment, we can always limit it at that time. I mean, and it, and it already says that. Well, also under that one, under that same item, I mean, it, it, you know, it's really incumbent upon the mayor running the meeting, whoever that mayor is, that you know the information is not repetitive. That it you know you don't um, um, repeat the same information either in a different format or in the same format. So I mean, just by simply reminding the individual, you know, we're here to hear new information doesn't mean that each individual is going to speak for five minutes. Because if an individual has already provided that testimony, uh, that testimony doesn't necessarily need to be repeated. Uh, but in those cases where people uh, need additional time, um, uh, it would seem fair to allow that to occur. That's my opinion. And, and the mayor has that option to do so. Correct. Yes, but everybody is preparing and trying to prepare based on a three minute pre presentation. Um, if it were five, um, maybe they would still only do three. I don't know. But it, it, it constrains them from the get go and they are not going to know until they get to the meeting whether they're going to get additional time. So I think it's, it's uh, the convenience to the public that they know they have five minutes. Um, I would just comment on that. Uh, I can remember my first council meetings um, where sometimes, most of the time, we would go possibly past the 11 o'clock and have to decide to continue. And when you go that late into a meeting, uh, I don't think you're as clear-minded when you're uh, considering issues. And I think that was the um, driving force behind uh, trying to limit to three, but giving permission if, if needed for longer. Um, and then as far as the mayor, um, 
The position and the title of mayor can be what you make it. I've seen some mayors that were satisfied with just conducting the meetings, but then I've seen others that have uh, used that title to accomplish a lot of things for the community. And there are certain boards that, as the mayor, you're the only one that uh, can serve on that board. There's one, I think it's the county yeah. public safety, and then there's a mayor and vice mayor. Um, City selection committee. City selection yeah, board. some yeah. of those. And it's really good to be able to establish uh, some kind of a relationship in those meetings as the mayor. And I don't think you can do that in a year, as well as if you have some things that you're trying to accomplish. Sometimes you need the time to do that. And I'm thinking, for example, the express bus that we now have that goes in the commuter bus that now goes into uh, Sacramento. It's been a big benefit. But it really took some time to make that happen and to get it through SACOG and to work it out with our bus company. So I think if you have the time, you can accomplish um, a great deal of, of good things for the city. Um, and I definitely would not want to change it at, at this point in the middle of our current mayor's term. Well, before we go any further, we do have one speaker sheet on the matter. Uh, Al Baldwin. Good evening, Al Baldwin, a very concerned citizen about this subject. Uh, I hope I can do it in three minutes. <laughs> I would prefer five, but never, I didn't even know the five minute rule would come up tonight, but it did. Uh, according to a 2006 survey, of the municipal governments by International City Council Management Associations, they're called ICMA. The most common mayoral, mayoral uh, term length is four years, and we're not there with four years. The table below, which I can read from, shows a percentage. And there's a lot of research went into this throughout a large area. Uh, four years, it was 45%. We're not there. Three years, went way down to 6%. Two years went up quite a bit to 35%. And the one year went to a very low 14%. So the majority of them are, for the smaller cities especially, is gearing around the two years. Now, Washington, when you go to Washington, D.C., and I haven't been in a political position, but I've been told that they like to go by titles. Everybody perks their head up when they say I'm the mayor or I'm just a councilman, I'm not belittling, belittling that, but they, they just don't, they, they listen, but mayor, in most of the situations, they listen to. Uh, that's in Washington. And the, I don't like to belittle or minimize the position of mayor in this particular town. They do a lot. They can do a lot. And I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to try and get it. It's very quick. Uh, term limits may reduce potential abuses of power by incumbents who stay too long in office. And that's why they don't want them in there very long. I don't think we have an abusive mayor or to be mayor or have been mayor. I just don't think so. And if you think that the, the uh, two-year term is going to give them abusive powers, I think you better look at it a little closer. Two years is plenty. It takes one year just to get your feet wet. The second year you can do what you propose. It's just the way it is. Uh, you also can control it by a council vote. So it's not an abusive situation. Two years, one year you get going, get your feet wet. Second year you dry your feet and you do what you said you were going to do the first year. Washington or here, it works both ways. So I, I just would like to see the two-year stay. This particular mayor that you've got right now has been to Washington a couple of times. He's presented cases in many ways, and he's gotten some results already. Just being a council member, just imagine what it'll be if he goes there with the title of mayor. So I'm just suggesting that right now, and I hope you uh, work on it. Thank you. So, 
in part actually, I'd like to respond. And anyway, the 45%, there are a large number of cities and large cities where the mayor is an elected position and absolutely they serve four terms. And that's what you'll find in when there's four year terms for mayor, it's because it's an elected position by the citizens. Our position for mayor is not an elected position by the citizens. It is largely a ceremonial position. Um, there is actually, and I have to look it up again, whether it's Citrus Heights or Rancho Cordova, where they rotate it yearly. They don't, they don't even, um, reorg they have a rotation worked out because of the belief that the mayor, so I don't really agree that the mayor can't accomplish anything during their term. You work on it. If it's a long-term project, the next mayor continues to work on it. And um, I see that as to be very reasonable. I think that the citizens don't um, have a voice in the selection of the mayor because they select the council and they elect the council and they think that the mayor sometimes don't understand how the mayor position works in our community. Um, so I still would propose and make a motion that the mayor position be changed to a, a mayor and vice mayor be changed to a one year term and then that we reorganize every year. I have a motion on the floor. Uh, I have a question before that, or I have a comment actually. Um, when Mr. Baldwin was speaking, um, I know he, he said abuse of power at least three or four times, and I don't think that has nothing to do with what I think Councilmember Hewer is talking about. Um, and so I, I want to make it very clear to the public that, that that's Al Baldwin speaking, not the city council. Um, and I, I, I do agree with uh, Councilmember Hewer in that. Um, a, and, and we're not going to get anywhere tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm certain of that. But I do believe that, you know, you look around. I think one, one, one. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether Elk Grove is uh, one or two years. Elk Grove is elected. Elected, elected. It's okay. an elected so, by the citizens, okay. as is Sacramento. So okay. those two. I didn't really. I looked at those two cities, but I looked at all the other residing cities within our area, and they all reorganize every year. every year. I would second the motion. Yeah, motion and second. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, before you yes. do call, just to clarify that if the motion passes, the rewording of 1.3.1 would read as follows. The election of the mayor and vice mayor shall occur at the first city council meeting in December of each year. Unless removed from office by the city council, the mayor and vice mayor shall each serve a one-year term. Okay. Okay. Call for vote, please. Council members. Councilmember Payne? No. Hewer? Aye. Campion? Aye. Crew? Nay. Motion dies. Next item was 1.5.9 regarding all persons to serve on committees and to be residents. Is that how you wanted that brought forward? Yeah, I think we should, I. When I just think we need to look at the members serving our committees living in the city of Gulf. I, there's been some issues in the past about the planning commission in particular, about it being people that live outside of our city. And I think that the residents need to be represented by citizens of our community, of our city, just like the city council is residents of our community. So I would make a motion to change 1.5.9 to all persons are eligible and that um, all, that to be all residents of the city of Gulf are eligible. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Call for vote, please. Do we have a discussion? Sure. I, I would just, uh, before we vote, say that we have had people serve on um, on commissions and committees from outside the city limits. And I think that they have provided some very valuable insight that is forth thinking because the city more than likely is not going to stay within the boundaries that it is now. And it's good to have uh, input from the people that maybe they live outside the city limits, but they certainly contribute to the city in many ways, whether it's shopping or uh, uh, they go to our schools. I think that's important too. So 
I'm happy to find good people that live maybe not within the city limits, but um, certainly can, can make a good contribution to the future of the city. So would you look at a jurisdictional, like maybe live within the boundaries of the high school district and or that, something yeah, within that, that? Because the way this reads, we could have somebody be appointed to our, they could, they could live anywhere. Yeah, they could live anywhere. I, I think that's pushing it, but you, know, you could, but I can't see anyone doing that. Well, well the high school district goes into San Joaquin County. Mm -hmm. And that, well, then if you say the high school district, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'm just saying. I'm think, satisfied with it as it is. Well, what was the former fire district boundary would be a better mm -hmm. representation, uh, not the current boundary. Yeah, I'm okay with it like it is. Um, and may, maybe we could uh, think about that uh, a little bit more rather than taking a vote tonight. I don't know whether. Uh, I'm willing to do that. Yeah, maybe we could. I mean, I, just, I mean, we don't ask. Tonight, we didn't ask for about anybody's residency no. um, before we made the appointments. Um, and I just think that there is, as we continue to to, uh, to expand and to grow, that it's something we need to look at, but I'm very willing to table that. And, okay. yeah. so, um, I, I do know that we have a lot of people that serve like on the historical uh, commission or committee that definitely do not live within the state limits. But they have a lot to, to offer, so I think it's something that we should think through. Okay, I'm we currently gonna... have a motion on the floor. Do you withdraw that motion? Withdraw. Okay. And the last item that you did, we were bringing up was from three to five minutes mm -hmm. on the speak speaking time. Go for it. Which item was that? Uh, 4.73. 4.73. Motion or? I'd make the motion to um, limit it to five minutes. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second that. Do I have a discussion? Having no discussion, call for the vote. Council Member Payne? Aye. Viewer? Aye. Champion? Aye. Approved? Aye. I did have one other question. Uh, and I. Maybe it's a typo on in section 3.5.3. At least my copy, the second sentence says O disclosure. I don't know what O disclosure or mention. No, what that is? O disclosure. Okay. So well, we can fix that. Okay. Okay, do we have any other items within the the guidelines for council? I do have a question under 4.11. 4 this um, under agenda packets, um, it says the packets and staff reports will be available for public review beginning Friday evening before each city council meeting. Well, with the city being closed every Friday, members of the public don't have an opportunity to review reports until Monday. Um, and, and if you're not in town, sometimes council members don't get to either. Although the, the clerk has been very good about making special arrangements when necessary. But I think with this alternate study, I think we, with the alternate work schedule that we work under, the staff does, that we need to think about um, how we can make these things available on Thursday. And I know that that's a, a real challenge, but I think that uh, right now it's, not, it's just simply not available. It may be available online, and I'm not sure when it goes up online. Well, I mean, I can tell you what our procedure. We always strive to have them done by end of day Thursday, Thursday. and to have it online Thursday as well. Sometimes it carries over to a, a Friday. To Friday. But well, not end of day Friday, I, I will say there. So I'm wondering, Never that long. Yeah, because this, this clearly, I mean, Friday doesn't do anyone any good. So I don't know what other council members think of this, that, uh, or staff. I mean, because you're the one that's affected. I mean, hmm. the clerk's the one that just puts is putting everything together, but she's got to get the material before it can be put together. So I know that's where a lot of times we've got to hang up. I think it's a good point that since we are, since the city hall is closed on Friday, um, 
they don't, the public doesn't have the opportunity to get the hard copy, and not everybody has access, I guess. And not everybody has a computer. That's, right. that's exactly what I mean. So, would it be very hard to push the deadline, city manager? Would it be very hard to push the deadline back a day so that it gives us that extra day? Well, I think, like Liz said, we, I wouldn't say always, but 98% of the time we have it available by the end of the day on Thursday and we strive to do that. I'd hate to, you know, make it, I don't, and I don't know what this, if this would make it so we couldn't have a council meeting if we didn't have the agenda packet available. I think we would have it, you know, that's the goal is to have it done by Thursday. Uh, so there are times when, you know, something happens at the last minute and we've got to get it, get it on rush job and it happens, you know, Friday morning I think is probably the latest we ever have it available and, and maybe an option is to have it available at the library or some other public place that people could go. If I think the library is open on, uh, on Friday. And, and we actually, uh, it's one of our posting requirements is the Galt Library, the Marino Lawrence Library. So whenever we're posting uh, the agenda, we're taking a copy to the library as well. So that so the, 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 whole, packet, the whole yeah. packet goes to the library the so members packet. of the public could go on a Friday. If they know where to go. Right, we yeah. could, but we could post it on the, you know, or post it on the door, door, door or something like that. I, and I know, you know, from from history, one of the problems with that is when one package is available, an interested party will take what they want, whether they're supposed to or not, and you end up with an incomplete agenda packet. And I know that's happened even in the clerk's office. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that does create a problem. I, I, I don't think that it should read Friday if we're closed on Fridays, because that clearly can't be accomplished. You know, if you want to say, you know, best efforts for Thursday or whatever, but I think we should try and it should be, it should say Thursday. Sir, um, just a point, are we under Rule 4.11.3? I'm looking at 2. Oh. Staff reports a bill for public. Oh, beginning Friday. Friday, maybe for each city council meeting. Mm -hmm. I guess it doesn't really clarify what that means by available for public review is they certainly are available for, for public review, whether they're available in hard copy or not doesn't necessarily specify. If the council wanted to have it changed to say Thursday, we could certainly well, I think it's more consistent that. than what the opportunity is. Most people would think if, if they don't have a computer, I don't have it available for public review. If they don't know about the library or, or whatever. I, I just think it's, you know, it's a technical issue and I know that the clerk's office tries to get it done on Thursday, but I think it's just a cleanup. It needs to at least say Thursday because it's impossible to do a hard copy on Friday. Would you repeat where it's located? Oh, We're down here looking four point one one. Four point one one point two. Oh. And the interesting thing about that four point one one point two is it says beginning the Friday evening before each city council meeting and the reality is we've never been open on Friday evening so when this was put in place it didn't really have anything to do with our alternative work schedule. I'm not sure what was intended when that was first yeah, I, drafted. I don't know. I'm just saying that that's what it says. It says, it says beginning the Friday evening so We've never been open on Friday evening, so... Well, I know, but if you read down the agenda packets, which is the same thing, will be available to council members on, on the Friday prior to Tuesday. But that's so, for council. Yeah, but... So here, what it's, I think what it's implying is council's going to get the agenda packets before the public. Kind of out of order, but I think they're saying council's going to get the agenda packets before it goes to, for public review. I, I don't know. Maybe that's it. I, I don't know. I don't know. I still think it should read Thursday. So the council gets the council packets are ready on Tuesday. Thursday. 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 Usually, Thursday. Thursday. Yes. Thursday. Yeah. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> on average, we usually have them Thursday by four o'clock. Um, so. So if I can make a suggestion, I think that there's a lot of things going on in this area. You know, 411.1 deals with the packets, 2 deals with the agendas, minutes, staff reports, which is actually part of the packets, and then point 3 is agenda packets for council. I would suggest that if the council 
once this changed, instead of maybe rewording it right now, just give us a sense as to what you would desire the result to be, and we'll come back with some uh, revised rules under this whole section for your consideration. That's fine. So, is the what, what would you like them to do? Well, I'd like to see us move towards Thursday also. Yeah. Just because if we're closed on Fridays and it's not available, then it should be Thursday. We say Thursday. Thursday. Then it's on the issue. Someone says, hey, I came down and did it on Friday and no one was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay. I agree. Mm -hmm. We're good with it. works. Okay. So you want to put something to that? Yep. Yeah, we'll work on language and bring it back for your consideration. Thank you, sir. Anything further on procedure guidelines? That's all I have. Yes, Mayor? I'm good. Okay. Next item, finance. Amended general fund, fund balance, and reserve policy. Inez. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, and Committee Members. This evening, staff is recommending that Council adopt the attached resolution approving the updated general fund, fund balance, and reserve policy. The city actually adopted the first reserve policy back in November 2003. And back then, or even today, we have um, various designations for the reserve policy and they are attached in the table on Table 1. In 2009, the Governmental Accounting Standard Board, GASB, um, issued GASB Statement Number 54 entitled Fund Balance Reporting and Governmental Fund Type Definition which basically did not change the bottom line of the fund balance, but what it did do is it changed the categories of fund balance. There are the following fund balance designations now, non-spendable, restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. So the city's current 2003 reserve policy um, is still shown in our financial statements, but it all falls under unassigned fund balance because it doesn't meet some of the criteria of GASB 54. Primarily, it doesn't state the specific use of that reserve, and it doesn't mention or talk about the infrequent occurrence of using those funds. So the purpose of the revised policy is basically to address the general fund's reserve amounts in a manner that would now be consistent with GASB Statement 54. Um, what we are asking is that the policy would replace the existing 2003 policy. It would satisfy GASB 54 requirements by noting <coughs> the actual specific use and the occurring infrequency or infrequently use of how we would tap into those different reserves. Um, Currently, one of the reserves that we did want to mention is the economic stability component of the policy, and it's currently sized at 20% of the general fund and culture and recreation fund operating expenditures. Currently, that's estimated at just under $3 million. Other provisions of the new policy include some of the longstanding committees as approved by council, and that is the Winter Bird Festival, the Youth Committee, the Beautification Committee. We know that there are current funds for the Regional Law Enforcement Training Facility, so all of those designations are now included in the policy under the reserve policy, and those would all be committed or classified as committed because those have come before the governing body. The new policy also defines surplus and deficient fund balance amounts and the ways to address them. It also has additional procedures and definitions um, within the policy. Lastly, since the new policy's minimum reserve requirement is about $2 million less than the, than the 2003 reserve policy, it allows for what we're working on right now is a forthcoming internal service fund. And it's basically taking money. What our intent is, or our goal is, is that we will take the internal service fund and basically start to look at um, replacing, having sufficient funds so that when our capital assets, our rolling stock, our buildings, when they are fully depreciated, that we have sufficient funds on hand to replace that rolling stock, that computer program or the computer hardware and that building. So that's the intent. That's not included in this policy this evening. That's a separate policy that we are working on right now and we'll be coming back to you hopefully within the next half of the fiscal year. But it does at least set up that we could fund the internal service fund. So we are still working on that. The interesting part about the internal service fund, just for information, is that we currently have capital assets in the general fund and culture and recreation fund values of approximately $34 million. Life-to-date depreciation, what they have depreciated those assets, is over $21 million. 
So if we really wanted to have sufficient funds to replace those assets that have been fully depreciated, we would have 21 million set aside. We don't have that, so we have to come up with a plan. Current depreciation is just over a million dollars, so we are working on a plan that we do want to bring back to council, and it's going to be an internal service fund. So with that, I've mentioned the highlights of the, of the fund balance, um, fund balance report and reserve policy. There are no fiscal, direct fiscal impacts as a result of the adoption of the plan. The goal of this um, policy is basically to bring our reserve policy into compliance with GASI Statement 54. So with that, I can answer any questions that you have, or if not, I would ask that Council accept the fund, general fund, fund balance, and reserve policy this evening. Any questions from Council? This is sort of a requirement that we do this, isn't it? It is a requirement that we adopt a policy consistent with GASI 54, but again, our current policy is compliant in that we don't really have restrictions on it, so it automatically will fall under the unassigned. That's just the way GASI 54 reads. You haven't really identified when you would use the money. You haven't identified what the frequency of the use would be. So by the nature that we haven't really spelled out those definitions, it automatically becomes unassigned. So the fund balance report that we have in front of you is the non-spendable if you have inventory. We know we can't touch that. And then we have the restricted, and those are basically outside restrictions when we receive CDBG monies. We can't use that for payroll unless it's related to CDBG projects. And then we have the committed, and those are the items that we come in front of council, and council is aware of that. The assigned basically is given authority to the city manager is what's presented this evening. And that's standard for when we have a two-year budget. Some of those amounts for a project will automatically be having expended capital items for a vehicle for whatever reason, then it automatically rolls forward to the next fiscal year. We are asking that the city manager continue to have the authority to do that. It's included within the budget document, but basically that would be an assigned fund balance. <clears throat> and everything else basically would fall in on the site. Okay. The, the, uh, so the purpose, the, the purpose of the, of the uh, Economic Stability Reserve Fund is to uh, earmark certain funds that were normally otherwise unassigned and available for any general fund expenditure. Is that correct? Today that is correct. That's the way it would be. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, instead of having a, a larger unassigned reserve, we're now imposing a restriction on, I guess, on the council itself or the city itself through the budgetary process to where we can only spend those monies as they are allowed under the new policy that hasn't been developed with regard to capital, capital assets. Is that correct? Well, the economic stability is already defined in the policy. Okay. So what that would mean is in order for us to tap into um, the economic stability, one of the criteria that's mentioned on page four of the policy would have to have occurred. So the city of Galt unemployment rate would have to exceed 15%, for instance, or the secured property tax would have to go down by at least 10%. Something would have had to happen. There would have been a trigger that would say, well, wait a minute, let's take a look at it. Something happened. We need to dip into our reserves. Right now, everything's an unassigned. We call it our reserve policy, but we didn't really say, when do you use it? So, and, and would, would contributions be made based on the policy that 20% of the operating budget fund, fund amount, that would be the targeted amount on an annual application to this fund, or, or how would that work? Well, we would, we would say that the target amount is 20%, and that's what's reflected today. Correct. That's, but the minimum, we're saying, is 10%. So it would just stay at that 20% of op operating expenditures for the general fund plus the cultural recreation fund. That's the recommended target, and that is what's funded right now if council accepts this policy. It there would be no additional contributions until we look at some other, until we start to address the internal service fund, because at this point, there's no amount being earmarked for that. And the internal service fund, we hope, will kind of replace what our capital replacement fund is. So we right now establish that I believe like 10% of capital assets. So the right. internal service fund will address that, but that's going to be a separate policy, not part of the fund balance policy. Okay. I guess my concern was that maybe we're unnecessarily restricting funds unless one of these events occurred, like you just read, uh, and whether is that really an appropriate amount? Do we really want to put 20% there of, of, of revenue uh, that, that otherwise may be available for other general fund purposes? So that's really the question. 
right? And, and that's something to consider. What we did is we actually looked at GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association, for best practices. We also did a survey of over 50 um, cities, and the median amount that was set aside for the economic stability was 20%. Okay. We figured they had more experience, it was the best practice, and we had 50 other cities to rely on. There wasn't any negative comments on it. So um, it's something that is new to us, so this is our recommendation. Clearly, if at some future date we have to look at this at least once every four years, if council says, wait a minute, our unassigned is getting a little low, maybe we should revisit, maybe it should be 10%, 15%. Okay. This is kind of our target today. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Any more questions? Okay, the recommended action is to adopt a resolution approving the updated general fund, ba fund balance and reserve policy. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Payne? Aye. Councilmember Hewitt? Aye. Councilmember Campion? Aye. Mayor Cruz? Aye. Thank you. Unanimous? Well, you're not off the hook that fast. Next item up, City of Galt Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2014. Memorandum of Internal Control and Required Communication for the year, end, year ended June 30th, 2014 and Independent Accountant's Report on the Compliance with Proposition 111, 2013-2014 Appropriations Limit Increment. Inez. That's me again. Well, good evening. Um, so this evening staff is recommending that council accept the three reports that you just mentioned, so I won't repeat those. But I do want to go over um, the reports a little bit more in um, detail. So the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, otherwise known as the CAFR, is this document that you have in front of you. And it's made up of three different sections. There's an introductory section, and that basically presents the organizational structure of the city, talks about the services that the city provides, and the legal environment. We have the city, we have the successor agency, we have a public financing authority, and so on. The second section of the CAFR is the financial section, and that includes the independent auditor's report, the management discussion analysis, also known as the MD&A. It, it includes our basic financial statements, the required supplementary um, information, as well as the combining individual fund statements and schedules. The final section of the CAFR is the statistical section, and what we try to present is at least 10 years of information when it's available. The city's financial statements have been audited by the independent firm of Mason Associates, which is a group of licensed certified public accountants. And the goal is basically, or their goal, and our goal as well, is that they can issue an unqualified opinion on our financial statement that the individual reader can rely on the information that is being presented. And uh, we did receive an unqualified opinion. We will go over some comments that they did um, note in the management report. But um, I would like to go over some of the financial aspects of the CAFR. Typically, um, we have provided a pre-audit financial report. Unfortunately, just due to other projects we had as well, we were unable to do that. So I am going to include a little bit of the financial information that I would typically provide in the pre-audit report. The general fund, which basically compares the actual year-end information to the budget that you saw back in June. So in the general fund, we saw that the revenues actually increased by over $157,000 from budget. Those are primarily in two areas of property taxes and self and in sales tax. The culture recreation revenues were higher than budgeted by $65,000. That was primarily in market revenues, which is from the uh, space rentals over at the market. General fund expenditures actually were less than budget by $834,000. But it's important to note that we also have encumbrances and commitments that are not in that number, and once you take that into account, the actual savings were just over $22,000. Within the Culture and Recreation Fund, um, there were actual savings of $125,000. However, again, when you take out the contracts, encumbrances, and so forth, the actual savings was just over $33,000. There were various transfers in and transfers out, but the net effect of the transfers in and out had a positive amount of $147,000 in the general fund. The amount of transfers had an overall decreased impact in the culture and recreation fund in the amount of $200,000. When everything is said and done, bottom line is the general fund had a positive increase in available fund balance of $327,000 um, over the budget. The culture and recreation fund was less than um, the budget amount by $101,000.
Um, I would like to mention briefly that um, the enterprise funds, our water, sewer, and solid waste were higher than budget amounts for operational charges, and we saw the largest increase in revenue based on the sewer connection fees, and all of the expenditures were in budgeted amounts, primarily because the larger projects were being carried forward into the new fiscal year. We're all familiar with the water meter retrofit project, the wastewater treatment plant arsenic treatment, and the live oak pump station in Forest Maine. Measure R um, was within budgeted amounts, and as of last fiscal year, fiscal year 13-14, there were seven officers um, budgeted, inclusive of the COP fund position, as well as two dispatchers. That covers the financial section. The second report that I do want to talk about is the Memorandum of Internal Control and Required Communications. This is this document. and we refer to it as the MOIC. But it's basically um, a report on that it covers three areas of possible deficiencies in internal controls. The first level is a material weakness, and that is considered as deficiency in internal control, where there's a weakness in the design um, in the system, and basically management in the normal course of business uh, was not able to detect or correct an error. There wasn't one material weakness that was noted, and it is on page three of the report. The item had to do with capitalization of expenditures. The item specifically dealt with, over the last several years, we recorded the amounts expended on the Central Gulf Interchange project as construction in, pro in progress. Um, we spent millions of dollars on that project, and we did not show it as a completed project, but we did recognize the amount that we did expend. The fact that the property itself is owned by the state of California meant that we should not have recorded it. We were keeping track of the expenditures, but the bottom line, what Gatsby Statement 34 basically says is the primary, the owner, and the continued responsibility for maintenance um, is responsible for recording those expenditures. So we should not have recorded the expenditures, and it wasn't until we actually completed the project, short of the landscaping, and we're about to move it over to our fixed asset uh, report that this topic came up in order to address this item, we basically have um, revised the internal memo form and now we include a section that says status ownership of the project. So hopefully we should anticipate or address this before we actually even start to record the construction in progress. This happened for two projects, the Central Gulf Interchange Project and the other project we all know <laughs> is the Twin Cities Roundabout Project. So it was two projects that, that um, brought this material weakness up. The second level of internal controls is a significant deficiency. There were no significant deficiencies noted in the current year. And other matters are the third area for internal controls, and they basically present any items that they believe could be of additional value to the city of Galt. And um, what they did present was that there are some upcoming GASI pronouncements that um, we should be sure that we are implementing timely, and it was basically informational. There was also some items on prior year comments and deficiencies. We believe that we have addressed those items and feel that we have been very successful in addressing and maintaining the items that they did mention in the prior year. The third item that we are asking for council of acceptance is the independent accounts report on compliance with Proposition 111. And this is this document. It should be your third and final one-page document in your packet. And the city received this report commenting on our calculation of the appropriations limit, and there, there were no exceptions noted. The single audit report is not included in your packet this year, and that's because we actually did a calculation on how much was expended. The threshold is that you have to at least expend $500,000 in federal awards in the fiscal year. We were just under that. We were about $485,000, so you do not see a single audit report this fiscal year. We do not meet the criteria for a single audit. So with that, the financial impact is that if Council accepts the reports that's presented this evening, we will incorporate the actual audited numbers into our budgetary documents. Um, and I am joined this evening with Michelle Levy, Accounting Manager, Matt Boring, Analyst, and Catherine Nguyen, who is a partner with Maiden Associates. So with that, I would ask for your acceptance of the three reports mentioned, and we are here to answer any questions if you have any. Council, questions? With the... Um, Reconciliation. Will the monthly expenditure reports be available publicly at this point now, or say in January forward, or December forward? 
because the, there were, the, you know, the monthly uh, expenditure reports that would come out by department, basically citywide. Were those being published up until, or are they currently being published? Yes, we were backlogged when we were closing the book. The first report that we actually is, actually issued was September's. We issued all of them just to catch up. Okay. But September's report was the first report that we actually said everything's entered. We, we basically recommended look at your first report for September because there was some cleanup and okay. so forth. So, but September, um, we have been on track. I think we just issued November's report today. Did we issue those or will they, are they scheduled for tomorrow? Okay. Okay. So I know that we okay. just reviewed those. But yeah, I think, my you, I think you did that. say that because we had this conversation. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, the recommended action is accept the City of Galt Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, CAFR, for fiscal year ended June 30th, 2014. Memorandum of Internal Control and Required Communication for the year ended June 30th, 2014. An independent accountant's report on compliance with the, pro with the Proposition 111 2013 2014 Appropriations Limit Increment. And we can vote on all these as one, correct? Yes. I do have a motion? I do move to accept these reports. Do I have a second? Second. Call for the vote, please. Thanks, Mayor Payne. Aye. <coughs> Council, meeting. Council, meeting. Council Member Hewer? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Mayor Cruz? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to communication. City Clerk? Just, uh, Actually, we've covered both those. Hmm? We've yeah, covered we both of those. Comments? I do, have, I do have a couple comments if All right. Council will indulge me for a moment. Um, and if I have to stop, just continue on. This. I think okay. I never said a word. Um, just a short something. As you know, I'm retiring from my full time position as Clerk Administrator on December 29th. I look forward to this new chapter and spending more time with my family and taking on new opportunities. Though I am retiring as clerk administrator, I did intend to retain my part-time elected clerk position through the end of my current term of office, 2016. <clears throat> However, it has come to my attention in working with PERS that the current law does not permit me as an, act, uh, as an active retiree to be an elected official in the same retirement system. So unless I reach a different conclusion with PERS by the time I retire as the city's full-time clerk administrator on December 29th, I will also likely be resigning my elected city clerk position at that time. Um, I will keep everybody informed on developments over the next several weeks. Uh, in regards to my full-time position, it's been amazing, uh, amazing 28 years. I've enjoyed almost every minute of it, um, and, and I just wish everybody well. Uh, I'm not going to go individually, but you know the staff's amazing. Council's been so good to work with. Um, just and and the number of councils I've worked with, uh, you know, goes back to Mary Lawrence and Steve Sikelski and Orville and Cedro, and it's it's been a great ride. So, and I was able to say all this to that. <laughs> and thank, just thank everybody. And I'll be around. I, I, um, you know, we'll we'll see what if Pers does something different, but uh, probably not. But anyway, thank, thank you. you. Comments by staff. Mr. Winkler. Mr. Mayor, uh, I just wanted to uh, recognize that Stormageddon wasn't. <laughs> at least not in the city of Galt, city limits. Uh, we were pleased to report that we didn't have any trees down, very minimal, uh, just localized, sort of the usual suspects for localized flooding. Uh, uh, I wanted to thank uh, PD for uh, helping us anticipate and activate the local EOC and get organized and loan radios and things uh, for the ability to have people on standby and communicate. Uh, thankfully, we didn't have to call anybody back in after hours other than uh, typical normal things and the uh, um, city fared well. Uh, Greer Basin uh, did what it was supposed to do, folded within six inches of the overflow weir, but uh, it's all been pumped back down and is ready for the next storm. And I uh, wanted to especially thank our crews that uh, put a lot of effort into preparing so that if the storm got here, it wouldn't be a problem, and it, it thankfully wasn't, and we're just very blessed uh, to have dodged that bullet and want to thank staff and PD for helping us be prepared. 
Armando? Mr. Solis? Chief? No one? Comments by Council? Mr. Campion? Have a happy holiday. Lori? No comments. <laughs> Vice Mayor? Uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, all that. But also I want to take the opportunity to say what a terrific job the Parks and Recs Department did. And I guess they had some help from uh, the other agency, which I'm not sure what we call it right now. But, uh, during the Christmas holidays and everything that came up, I know they worked really, really hard. Uh, I think I saw Armando out there lying of the night. I think he was having a good time, actually. But still, it was a lot of work, and I think we need to uh, appreciate and uh, acknowledge the extra work they did. And thank you very much. Thank you. Add one more thing to that. The police department also was a third department that helped us through with the parade and with the officers and the caps and the cadets. Without yes. the caps and the cadets, they're just we couldn't do these types of events. So they they really helped us out a lot. All of you are great. Okay. Um, I too want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and you're right. Stormageddon didn't turn out to be what it was, but I was very impressed with staff. I uh, want the citizens to know you've got a staff that's on the ball, I and mean, literally within hours of this whole thing taking place, we had staff getting together, putting together a game plan, who was going to do what, who reacted to where. Um, I was totally and completely confident that if this thing did hit, we had it dialed in. The city of Galt was going to be fine, and I thank you all. And with that, I wish you all a happy, happy holiday, Merry Christmas, and this meeting is adjourned.